Welcome to Life Transformation, a weekly podcast from Sunrise Church in Surrey, British Columbia. Stay tuned to hear inspiring messages and teachings, giving you hope and purpose, leading you to a life-changing relationship with Jesus as you follow Him. So if you're with us today, we've been uh, doing a series called Followers Are Formed For. Say the word with me. I'm done. I'm, I'm. <laughs> Coach, you're with me today. Followers are formed for? Okay. If you're new to our church, you might be new. You might not, you might not expect to talk in church. You're allowed to talk back to me in church as long as it's nice and respectful, okay? Followers are formed for mission, and I want to talk a little bit about today uh, about how we're formed and how God wants to form our minds have you ever collected anything? Is there any collectors here? There's, like, you might collect, like, anything, anyone, any collectors? Adam's a collector. Anyone else at the back? Victor's a collector. Yeah, Josh, a collector. Okay. I had a friend whose family loved to collect oil lamps. Oil lamps. I got a picture of, of some oil lamps here. So if, if you've never seen these before, these are what oil, oil lamps are, and they, you know, they burn oil. And, and has anyone ever used one of these before? Okay. That's good. Okay, I'm in the right crowd. Now, if you've never used one of these before, basically there's oil in the bottom. You light the wick on there and you can burn them and you can get them high and low. And, you know, they would use these in the old days. I know like the stories of my grandfather actually um, getting burnt in a fire because he had to take this lamp out that was, that was flowing oil everywhere. And he ended up getting burned like severely bad because this is what you used to do back in the day. And people still use these. There's nostalgia. But I had this friend and they had like, like there's what, like eight of those up there. They had a whole case a whole wall displayed of these things because they were collecting them and they thought, you know, one day these things are going to be of value and then they're going to sell them back and they're going to be on the antique roadshow and they're going to make some money and that's how it's going to be. And they left them there and they were just like on display. Now there's something about collections that people display them because they're supposed to be seen because they're nice or they have some value. The interesting thing about collections are most collections are never used. Are you with me? They don't use them. They never took these lamps off the shelf and said, let's just see if this thing still works. Let's just see if there's still oil in it. Let's just see if we can light this thing up. Collections weren't used. They're pretty, they're nice, they're sitting up there, but they weren't used. And I think a lot of times we have slipped into this idea that God wants to make us just his collection. He wants to make us look nice, put us on a shelf and just set us there and go, oh, look at how these people are nice like me. But God is not a collector or a curator of people. He is a person who puts us on co-mission with him. Are you here today? Are you with me? God doesn't want you as some pretty person that looks like him on a shelf. That's not the design of your life. He wants to make you look like him, but he wants to make you in a way that you can be used for him. He's not a collector or a curator. And here's what I understand about where we're at today, in just in culture and in life and in our church. If you're feeling weary, depleted, worn out, really feeling frustrated because of the things of life and the pressures of the last years that have seemed to kind of wear you on all sides, you're in a good place. Because there's things that Jesus can do by his spirit that only Jesus can do as he fills you. He can renew you and fill you. And I promise you this, is that when we get in the presence of God, and when we pray, and when we sing, and when we practice these things, it's not just because we do them because we're supposed to do them, or we do them because we know to do them. We do them because there's something that God does in our lives when we get in his presence. There's something God does when we begin to pray. There's something God does when we begin to jump into his word and read his word. There's something of life giving that comes from those very things. I got a text... um, earlier this week, and, and let me just read it to you because it was actually a real, a real encouraging text for someone who had, uh, had just been walking through different stuff. And they said this to me, uh, Pastor Chris, you have been asking us about what has shaped us in the last season. And they said, for me, I made a change in my life. I cut out coffee, gasp, okay. And I started my morning with devotions and actually getting down on my knees to pray quick every morning, it's reframed my days. That's what's happening when we put these things in front of us that we're supposed to do. 
And, and sometimes you do them out of duty, but when you actually practice them, like, man, it makes progress in our life. It starts to do things that only God can do. If you feel weary or depleted, and you're like, I don't feel like I even have enough energy to pray or read the Bible, that's where we need the community of God. That's where we need to reach out to people, and we need to have people in our life to encourage us and inspire us and, in, and push us forward. As we've been talking about, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the questions that we've been talking with. Um, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, I think it should be, yeah, we're in the Bible. I'll, I'll jump back to that one in a minute, but let's go forward. The question we've been talking about isn't uh, if you're being formed, but what you're being formed by. It's not if you're being formed by the things around you, by the media you read, by the people around you, by your family. It's not an if question. It's what are you going to be formed by? So we have the choice of our inputs to be formed. Okay, let's go to our next question because we want to talk about uh, let's do this together. Can we say this together? What are you being formed for? Say it together with me. What are you being formed for? This is a question for the body of Christ. The answer is this. God desires to form us for mission. You know, we talk a lot about spiritual formation, and I said this last week. Sometimes spiritual formation wants to uh, see us be made into disciples of Christ, look Christ-like, but we, we detach that from mission. So I prefer the, the, um, the terminology of what's called missional formation. And the reason why is because God didn't call the disciples and say, follow me and I will make you good Bible plan readers. Follow me and I will make you good prayer people. Follow me and I will polish you up so all your rough edges are off and you just look nice and you're like a collection on the shelf. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And all the practices that they learned of prayer and presence and worship and word came to enhance that very call. A lot of times when I get the chance to be with people or teach people, I'll ask them the question, what's the end goal? I sit with Bible college students and I'll say things um, about preaching and I teach preaching and I'll say to them, where do you think God is calling you into? What is he calling you to? And if they say, God's calling me to an unreached people group, I say, okay, the way I'm preaching here is not going to work. So you need to form that for what the mission is. Jesus didn't call people to be perfect little word readers, prayer people, presence people, community for the sake of that. He called them to do that for the sake of the mission. Are you with me this morning? Amen. God desires to form us for, say it with me, it's really big, mission. Okay, next question. Let's go right there. Oh, say it together with me. How is he forming you? By the end of this sermon series, we're going to just memorize this. It's catechistic it is. Okay, how is he forming you? Let's see, how is he forming us? God desires to form us, say it with me, personally, relationally, and intentionally. I told you that our our world wants to try to form us personally because of targeted ads and and because of all the things that get thrown at us, but really it's God who can form you totally personally because he knows you and he has given you a name. It says that every name under heaven is given by God for his people. Uh, And then what is he forming us into? What I think is the next question. Let's go to that one. Or sorry, who is he forming you to be? Let's say it together. Who is he forming you to be? All right, the next one, the answer is, ding, ding, ding. God is forming us into his image. Say it with me, Christ-likeness and obedience on mission. Christ-likeness. So he wants you to be like him. He wants you to obey him, but he's doing it for the sake of mission. And as I said before, God didn't call the, uh, the disciples to follow him and be holy little people, although holiness is good. He didn't say, follow me and you'll crush that reading plan and you will get all of the stars and all of the badges. He said, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. As we talk a little bit about what God is wanting to form in us, uh, we realize that there's all sorts of influences around you trying to form you. And if you, if you don't realize that, I'll encourage you to do this. Fast media for two weeks. I mean, all media. News, Instagram, Tic Tacs, Tic Tac, jokes. Fast it all for two weeks and see how your mind starts to shift. Turn it off. Just see, see what happens. And you will be convinced of what we're talking about, that there is some shifting that will happen in your life because there's formation things all around you. Now, I believe this is that the place that God really wants to form me and you is actually in our identity in Christ. That's where he really wants to form us. He wants you to be so formed to be like him that you understand that your identity is key. And I want to draw you just to one scripture today before I call our special guest up today. I want you to turn over with me to the book of Matthew. And I want to highlight just a couple things in the book of Matthew. 
And I hope, I hope you say, Pastor Chris, I've heard you say this before because I want us to so know this because it's so very, very, very important. Matthew 3, and we're going to read just a little bit in the portions of um, uh, verse 16 of Matthew 3, and then we're going to jump down into chapter 4. And coach, if you want, you can bring those chairs now. That'd be great. This is Jesus. He's about to be baptized by his cousin, John. Verse 16, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, there was a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Amen. This is the son of God. God is well pleased with him. I always ask the question when I look at this text, what has Jesus done to this point? on earth. What has Jesus done to this point? I heard someone say something. Nothing. We know a little bit. We know that it was tradition to go to Jerusalem with his parents. We know that the pre-incarnate Jesus in eternity past did a lot of stuff, but he's not done anything, but he hears the approval of the Father when he walks through baptism. So is Jesus convinced that he's the Son of God at this moment? I see someone nodding. Anyone else? Is Jesus convinced that he's the Son of God? Yeah, he is. He knows. There's no question. Let's go down to chapter four, because I want us to hit this before we jump into the time with our guest today. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, chapter four, verse one, into the wilderness, attempted by the devil. After 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, listen to it, if you are the Son of God. What does the enemy immediately question in Jesus? Identity. He goes after identity. He goes right after that. So that's what we want to hear from our God is that we are his beloved and that we follow him. Actually, 43 times in the New Testament, the name used for Jesus, the beloved, is now put onto the church. Beloved or beloved. It's used 43 times by the authors of the New Testament to describe you and me. So look at a person beside you and say, you're beloved. And if you know them, you give them a little squeeze on the hand, but just keep it, keep it holy. It's Sunday, okay? Okay, then what, what's the next temptation? Follow me down into verse five. What does he say in verse, or sorry, verse six? Again, if you are the son of God, then you'll do this, throw yourself down. But what I love about Jesus, he, he gives back the word to the enemy and he tells the enemy very powerfully, it is written this, it is written this, it is written this. And look at the last thing he does. If you go down to verse 18, I think Jesus gets a little bit mad in the original language. We can't always understand the punctuation in Greek or in English because it wasn't there in Greek. But we get an exclamation mark in both of our Bibles so that we understand the power in the emphasis. Jesus says to him, be gone, Satan. You ever just get mad at Satan? You ever get mad because you feel like he's attacking you or he's kind of around you or there's like temptation? The words of Jesus were, be gone, Satan. He used those words and then he applied scripture. I believe that the enemy wants to come and attack our identity and he wants to come against our identity. So why do we need to know who we are in Christ? Because that is so foundational to everything God is going to do in and through your life. I would like to welcome to the stage, uh, Jonathan Malamura. Can you put your hands together and welcome this young man of God up to stage with me today? And coach, can we get him a microphone there? So we wanted to, uh, I like shifting things up a little bit and, uh, Jonathan, welcome. Thank That's you. That's for you. You can have that. Uh, you're prepared. You've got your Bible. You've got some notes. And uh, there we go. Pray like monks, live like fools. We want to talk a little bit about um, how we are formed. We want to talk about what forms us. We've got a couple questions. And, and Jonathan, I've, we've known each other, I don't know, an, a few months now? A couple months, yeah. A couple months now. We've, yeah. had, uh, we've hung out together. We've had lunch. We've talked a lot. You've been over at my house, and we've... we've uh, just gone back yes. and forth on what God's doing and what we're talking about in some of these sermons. Uh, so uh, your family is going to be here in second service, but tell us about your family a little bit. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Uh, you, uh, one thing I will say is you keep calling me a special guest, but I'm not special in any way. Um, so I'm honored that you would have listened to what I have to say here today. Um, but yeah, I, I'm 25 years old. I've been married to my wife for coming up to four years in December, um, and we have two little girls, uh, a two-year-old and a uh, will be six months. Um, we, can we just, can we yeah. just pray for them right now? Come on. That's yes. like a lot of, yes. It was, early, it was early morning today. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Yeah, awesome. And so um, you're also going to Bible college too, same time, I think? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I'm, doing, I'm going to uh, Portland Bible College online uh, part-time while I work at my full-time during the day. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, we've been interacting lots just about what God's been kind of stirring in the sermons and talking a little bit about um, how, how things form us around us. So we got a couple of questions we want to interact on today, a couple of scriptures we want to bring you, and we just kind of want to keep it fresh as we deliver stuff to you today. So um, hey, one of the questions, I want, I want to start with that, probably what we thought was maybe the third question. I want to go back to that. I want to talk about that question about like how, how are we or how are our minds influence? Like, how is that actually happening around us and in our lives? I want to talk a little bit about that. So I'll throw that one to you first, and then we'll interact a little bit on that one. And uh, there we go. How are our minds influenced? How are we influenced? Yeah, I mean, I think you've been touching on this a lot throughout the the series, that what we give what we give our attention to is what will influence us and form us. Mm -hmm. And so for those of us who are Christians, um, and follow Jesus and are his disciples, when we give our attention to the word and prayer and, and scripture, um, those are the things that influence us. But when we start to give our attention more to, say, social media mm. um, or negative thought patterns that come into our minds um, and don't do the work to figure out what's true in those thoughts and what's not true in those thoughts, um, then those negative thoughts can influence us. Um, and, yeah, uh, the world around us, um, the world in the sense of the values that uh, the place that either we work or live in, uh, the things that they say is ultimate or most important that aren't actually in line with what Scripture would right. say. Um, so, for example, one example would be like, there's a, I think all of us could agree in, in some context that uh, work culture or even just if you look at society as a whole, a lot of like toxicity around cynicism and sarcasm. And uh, we kind of laugh it off and think it's like nothing. But if we give our time and our attention there and keep, A, keep letting ourselves be cynical or sarcastic, right. then we start to become cynical and sarcastic people. And right. that's not actually the kinds of people that Jesus has formed us to be. Right. Yeah. And, and if we look at what the Bible says, who we're supposed to be, like we're supposed to be people of light. We're supposed to be people of light. And I think I remember a number of years ago, like when, when Facebook started changing from just like kind of positive posts, like and, and when it was new, people were like posting like pictures of their puppies and their kids. And then all of a sudden it was you were in the grocery store line and you were like, I literally can't believe how long this is taking in the line. And it's like, that's what Facebook started becoming. And then Twitter became, well, Twitter's like, anyway, <laughs> just Twitter. I don't know. But I think those values that have shifted, and social media has taught us a lot of those things, and we don't even, we're not even cognizant of it. It just starts shaping you because all of a sudden you realize that, you know, three people are complaining about the traffic on your street and you're part of a Facebook group that's complaining about this traffic in your area. And then all of a sudden you get shifted from being a person of light to a person of complaint. And I think that's really what we see. Um, I want to talk about where does resistance come from? Uh, and sometimes I like to use the word resistance. We can talk about that. But uh, where does like resistance or sometimes we call it spiritual attack. Where does that come from uh, for us as believers? Where is that kind of sourced? Yeah, I would say um, both what scripture teaches and uh, another helpful book that I've been reading uh, it's called Live No Lies by John Mark Homer, where he sets, sets up this helpful biblical framework of uh, the enemy, the flesh, and the world. Um, and so resistance or spiritual attack, the, the one that I think we're most familiar with is the enemy um, mm -hmm. that we read in, in, in Matthew 4 that Jesus interacts with. Um, but then there is also, Paul talks about, in Galatians 5, of the, uh, if we live according to the flesh, we will reap what the flesh desires, right. rather than if we live according to the Spirit, then we will reap what the Spirit desires. Um, and the third one that Jesus talks about um, in John 17 is the world, and kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, of the world in the sense of the ideas 
and value systems that the world tries to get us to believe or engage with that aren't in line with Jesus. And so um, when we talk about resistance, yeah, the most common one in church settings, I would say, is the enemy. But right. we also should recognize that there are two other ones that he does use uh, to attack us with as well. Um, so yeah, those... Is that, is that yeah, helpful? Yeah, no, that, yeah. that's kind of that's where we're going. So let me just say this. People often use the term spiritual attack. Has anyone even, even used it this week? Okay, spiritual attack, maybe. Here's what I, I love to use. And the reason we use the word resistance, if you remember what Jesus said in the book of Matthew, he talked about giving the keys to the kingdom to Peter and the whole dialogue about who's the Christ. And he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail or will not win over you, okay? When is the last time you saw a gate be on the offense. Okay? What does a gate do? A gate blocks you from something. A gate is actually defensive. And we know this, that the kingdom of God is going which way? Backwards? Or which way? Forward. What are the gates of hell trying to do? They're trying to block and resist and protect their territory. So I love the word resistance when we talk about what's classically called spiritual attack. Because spiritual attack makes me think that the enemy is the one winning. But I really believe the kingdom of God, when you read scripture, is the one that's going forward and the enemy is trying to resist. The other thing I'll say, let me just read in Galatians 5. And if you've got your Bible with you, please turn over to Galatians 5. And uh, we'll just look at verses 19. And uh, let's have some confessions. Uh, have you ever been angry before? Can we yes. put our hands yes. angry? Okay. <laughs> um, have you and I ever had jealousy before in our lives? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's lots of bad things here, which I won't mention. Uh, have we ever had strife? Has anyone ever had strife in your life? Strife, yeah. Has anyone ever been drunk before in your life? Okay, let's be honest. Has anyone ever been drunk before in your life? Okay. You don't need the enemy to make those things happen in your life. Because this, in Galatians, tells me this is the work of my flesh. Which is at war with the things of the Spirit. But when the Spirit wins out, then all of a sudden we get into love Joy, peace, patience, goodness, all of those things. So I think you talk about the enemy. We think of the enemy all the time, but we think, man, there's something that is at battle here. And then there's the world. And I just want you to read, if, let's go over to, um, to 1 John. I want to read this scripture for you. 1 John, flip over to 1 John, uh, verse 15. Uh, John says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the, fa- the, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he says this, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh... And the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So the world's trying to work against you as much as the enemy's trying to work against you. And uh, we get to resist him. And it says in, in Peter, it says in uh, Peter that he's going around like a roaring lion, right? Seeking to devour someone, but we get to resist. And I love that Jesus in that Matthew passage, he fought with the word, but then at the end, he said, be gone, Satan. And then he fought back with the word. So let's talk about kind of our last question. Um, we were talking about how do, how do scriptures like... 1 Corinthians, when it talks about the mind of Christ, or uh, 2 Corinthians, where it talks about taking captive our thoughts, because we really know the battle's here, like the battle's starting here. How, how do we apply those scriptures? How do we live into those scriptures? How do we move forward with those things? Yeah, yeah it's good. Um, one thing that was, as I was reflecting on this question, uh, I thought of an example, actually, in the Old Testament, uh, a story in 1 First, First Kings 19, and I won't go through it all. I'll just kind of summarize the, the important points, but... Um, the chapter four, you have Elijah, who is the main prophet of Israel going up against, um, the prophets of Baal. And he has the whole, uh, scene on the mountaintop where he calls, where literal fire from heaven consumes the altar. And then right after that, so he kind of has this like ultimate spiritual moment. Um, and right after that, uh, in the start of chapter 19, it says that, uh, Jezebel threatened to kill him, and instead of coming up against that resistance, right. that Elijah, you would think at the height of his his career, if you want to use that language, right. <laughs> he's like the super you, prophet yeah, right he now. Just he's had like, the most amazing moment. Happen. His stats are amazing. Yeah. This his guy stats are like, amazing. Yeah. You should yeah. have you should have knocked this one out of the park. That's right. Um, his but, his rookie card was like worth a lot of money, tons of money. Yeah, and then. I found another one, an, another one with a guy with a very similar name. But yeah. anyways, um, yeah, that, that story goes on to tell how Elijah actually felt fear. It says he, he was afraid and he felt fear and he fled. 
and he ran away. Um, and there's a conversation there where, where God, God is having a conversation with Elijah, and in one of Elijah's responses, he tells God that uh, basically what's happened, that like, I'm running for my life, they're trying to kill me, and I'm all alone. Mm. And I think right. that's a good example for us of how, how the enemy and our flesh even sometimes combine, and he's isolated, so there is literally no one around him. So he is true in that he is alone. But the reality is back home, there are hundreds of other prophets there that right. haven't been killed. Right. And so he's believing the lie that the enemy is trying to, to give him. Um, and because he feels alone in his flesh, that's coming out of him. And so, um, yeah, I just found... It's, it's, I, love, I love scripture because it gives us portraits and examples um, so when we have, like, the New Testament often, often teaches more, like, practical examples, there are helpful examples of the Old Testament of people's lives where we see this, uh, where we see it, like, played out or manifested. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. I think, you know, in that setting, how many times have you ever felt isolated or alone? Like, spiritually, emotionally, okay? And I think because the attack comes here, why does the attack come here? I'm convinced the attack starts here. Because if the enemy can get you here, he's going to stop you from the rest. You can't do the mission if he stopped you here. Now, for those of you who are old like me, can we show that picture of our friend Arnold? Can we just throw it up there? Okay. You might remember this. Does anyone ever, has anyone ever watched that before? Who is that up there? This Arnold, the Terminator. So, okay. What was the story in Terminator? Are you Sarah Connor? Why? He was going back to try to kill Sarah Connor because it was the son of Sarah Connor that destroyed all this all these robots and stuff like that right so like like the enemy he wants to go back and and cripple you and kill you before you even start that's what the terminator's job was in 1984 arnold schwarzenegger apparently it's a whole movie like family now and there's like been terminators like six of them or something i don't know if you follow terminator please repent of that um (laughs) just kidding so yeah you can take that down but the enemy he wants to get your mind because if he can get you here first he can stop any of the forward process and the isolation thing is big. Now, I want you to just jump back into Matthew 4 for a minute with me, and let's turn to verse 1, okay? Verse 1, because you're going to see a couple of really interesting things. Sometimes when we feel like we're tempted, do you ever feel alone? Right? Just listen to this, and I want you to see what the Spirit does when Jesus is going into the wilderness. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. What's the Holy Spirit doing when Jesus is in the wilderness? He's leading him. He's leading him actually into that. So when Jesus prays, lead us not into temptation, he's actually asking for the Holy Spirit to be leading you in and through those times. And it says he was tempted. In other passages, the other thing you'll read in the passage in Luke where Jesus is tempted, it said he was full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit. But I think the enemy loves to convince us, no, you're alone, Jonathan. Chris, you're alone. Like, no one, no one's, like, my family's in Saskatchewan. You're totally alone. Like, but the truth is, is that the Holy Spirit is always there with you. So what's the key we need to do? Well, Elijah just gives in to, like, like, woe is me. Like, I've lost all my stats now. I'm, no, I'm not a good prophet. That's the, um, the self-talk. So what do we do when we feel like we're isolated? We need to remind ourselves, no, no. Number one, God is always with me. And something happens. I believe when we confess that out loud, like I told you last week when I wake up and like last Sunday morning, I woke up and like on my knees, Lord, I don't have the strength. I don't have the power. I don't have the word. Uh, I just, I need you. I pray it out loud. When we start praying it out loud, what are we doing? We're informing our minds even. We're hearing ourselves pray. We inform our minds and we inform, we inform the whole spiritual realm of what's happening. And then that's when the Holy Spirit can come. Like Jesus, I need you. Holy Spirit, I need you. The second thing I think that's so key in this, that that God reminded uh, Elijah of, is like, look around. How many other people have I preserved that are following Jesus right now? So I don't know if you've got a prayer team around you or friends who are Christians, or maybe you're not even a Christian. You're like, I just, I'm kind of enjoying the fact that I'm in this church and it's kind of a neat thing. But communication that is instant can instantly change that isolation if you reach out. I say, I'm literally having a hard day. And church, we need to practice that very thing because the enemy wants to keep you isolated. He wants, but what, what happened with Jesus? He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness 
and he used the word of God to speak back. And the beautiful thing right at the very end of that passage in verse 11, and the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. What are some of the jobs of angels? Um, They don't replace the Holy Spirit. They don't replace God. They're messengers, guardians. In this case, they're ministering to Jesus. So I really think when we think of what's forming us, yeah, like all around we're being formed. And when we think of the flesh and even the world, we need to be wise. And a lot of times we, we want to blame the devil first. <laughs> it's like the devil first. And, and most classically, like the devil's probably not like literally after you as the person of the devil because he has a hierarchy of people that, that function with him. There's demonic attack all around us. And, uh, and we have the ability through the word of God to kind of press back and resist those very things. And I really think the practices that we practice in our lives are key for that very thing. So let's thank Jonathan today for coming up and uh, giving us a little bit of stuff. Did you want to mention this book as well? Sure, yeah. Um, Actually, I I wanted to share an excerpt from this book. Sure, yeah. uh, If that's okay with you. Um, Just uh, just because I found it helpful, and it kind of ties into a little bit about... um, even Jesus' own temptation, that the thing that I think we struggle with the most is to actually believe the stuff that we already know is true. Right. You know, like as, as people who follow Jesus for a long time, we can kind of slip into this either complacency or think that like the good news of Jesus and the gospel, it's like so, it's so true and so simple and almost like too simple in a sense and we can, we can kind of fade, but... Um, yeah, this book is called uh, Praying Like Monks, Living by Fools by uh, Tyler Staten. He's a pastor down in uh, the States, if you're interested. Uh, but he has this really good way of, of, of framing this, so I'll read it for you. It says, uh, here's a summary of the whole 66-book compilation if you want to save yourself some time. <laughs> I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that you are loved. Loved right now without qualification or restriction. Loved unconditionally for who you are. Loved in such a way that you can't lose. Hmm. The bad news is that you'll find it very hard to believe that and even harder to experience it. Your instinct is and will forever be to try and drum up your own lovableness, Hmm. to become lovable in some way you can define and control, and to try and become, in your own eyes, what you are already in God's eyes. Mm. The good news is called grace, and the bad news is called sin. Um, and I just felt like that was, that for me personally, was a really helpful way to frame that, like, yeah, the thing we need the most is to know our identity in Christ, right. to know that we are loved by our Father, and that that ultimately is the thing that matters the most, right. but that's also the hardest thing to believe because it's a daily thing. Right. And uh, I know for myself, there are days where I wake up and don't do the work of reminding myself of the love of the Father. And it's particularly on those days that I find it extremely challenging to wage the war with the enemy of the flesh and the world. Right. Um, because I haven't reminded myself of the love of God. I haven't reminded myself of the gospel and that he is with me in all right. scenarios and wherever I go. So, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you for reading that. One of the things that I'll just say when we study the Bible, we always look for a principle of first mention, what was first mentioned. And what I love about what was first mentioned over Jesus uh, when he's about to enter into ministry is that he's the beloved of the Father. And if there's anything that you remind yourself of, if you feel isolated or alone or in resistance from the enemy, that we are the beloved of the Father. Uh, So let's thank Jonathan one more time. And uh, I'll call the worship team to come because I really believe that um, uh, when we're in moments like this, like God wants to not only speak, but he wants to do something. And I believe this is that God does not want you on a shelf just looking nice, looking shiny, but with no flame and no oil in you like a lamp. He wants to pour that in you and he wants to pour his love upon you so that you can be enveloped in that and that you can be in with him doing his mission. And what I love about Jesus, uh, when we talk about that word commission, is that when you're doing things with Jesus and when you're walking with him, he's literally right there all the time with you. So if you would, would you stand with me as we just enter back into a few songs of worship? But I want to pray specifically for those of you who felt isolated or alone, or you felt like 
the spiritual resistance around you uh, is just pressing so hard that you feel like you can't move forward. I want to pray for you specifically today. So let's, let's pray. Father, as we come into this moment today, we ask, Father God, that we would be so aware of the things around us that are trying to form us, where the enemy is trying to resist, where, where our flesh is even in battle with the things of the Spirit and with the world that has its desires and its power that's trying to shape us, Lord. We pray we'd be aware in Jesus' name. And we pray, Father God, that as we're aware, that you would take us from places where we felt alone or isolated. Lord, where we felt like we'd been kind of under attack. And Lord, we haven't had any tools. Father God, we ask that you would just reveal to us first the fact that you love us. We are your beloved. And that you're with us at all times. And Lord, as you are there, we can call on you in those times. Lord, whether it's the deepest valleys we're feeling, emotionally, spiritually, even practically in our own bodies, Lord, or whether we feel like we've been on the mountaintop and things have been great. Father God, we know you are with us. And Father, I pray you'd also make us aware of those who are around us, friends, family, those we can call out to, Father God, in the midst of times where we feel like we're in resistance and there's isolation around us. We pray, Father God, that you would move in power in our lives today. In Jesus' name. just been listening to Life Transformation, a weekly podcast of life-changing messages, giving you hope and purpose. If you would like prayer or more resources to a better you, connect with us on our website, sunrise.ca, or follow us on Instagram at sunrisechurchbc.com.